Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Uncommon Types, some stories by Tom Hanks. So obviously this is Tom Hanks, the actor. Dane reads. Uh, I will say, I normally am pretty harsh with celebrity books because they're either ghost written or they are written by the celebrity, but obviously most celebrities aren't writers, so they're not particularly good. It's just like indie writing, but with a big budget behind it, you know? Uh, and here, you, you know, you do get the sense that Hanks must have worked with a pretty good editor. It does come across as his voice as well, especially with the subject matter of some of the stories, which is uh, quite often about like young struggling actors and stuff. Uh, I also don't think this would have been published by uh, Arrow, uh, which is a, a subsidiary of Penguin, because publishers notoriously hate to publish short story collections, especially from short time writers because they're so difficult to market. So I do think he benefited uh, from his celebrity there. But we'll uh, read the blurb and then we'll go through and check out some of my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, a small town newspaper columnist with old fashioned views of the modern world. A World War II veteran grappling with his emotional and physical scars. A second rate actor plunged into sudden stardom and a whirlwind press junket. Four friends travelling to the moon in a rocket ship built in the backyard. These are just some of the stories that Tom Hanks captures in his first work of fiction, a collection of shorts that explore with great affection, humour and insight the human condition in all its foibles. The stories are linked by one thing, in each of them a typewriter plays a part, sometimes minor, sometimes central. To many, typewriters represent a level of craftsmanship, beauty and individuality that is harder and harder to find in the modern world. In these stories, Hanks gracefully reaches that typewriter-worthy level, by terms whimsical, witty and moving, Uncommon Type establishes him as a welcome and wonderful new voice in contemporary fiction. So, let's get to it. So we'll start here with three exhausting weeks. I just like this little bit of dialogue. And this is from a recurring character, Anna. She's in it a lot. She's like this adventurous young woman. I like you too. I wondered if this conversation was going someplace. Are you flirting with me? No, Anna said. I'm propositioning you. Totally different thing. Flirting is fishing. Maybe you hook up, maybe you don't. Propositioning is the first step in closing a deal. Well, thank you for that clarification, Tomo. And uh, then they go to a karaoke bar and they get uh, this, this guy um, called M-Dash, sings songs with America in the lyrics. American women, American girl. Spirit of America by the Beach Boys is actually about a car, but we made him sing it anyway. And then they get him doing a horse with no name by the band America. I just thought this was good as well. Uh, Mr. Moore, a retired cop whose house shares my back fence, saw me running by and hollered out, what the fuck got into you? A woman, I yelled back. And not only was that true, but I felt good saying it. When a man thinks of a lady and looks forward to telling her that he ran 40 minutes, well, partner, he's living in girlfriend territory. Yes, I had a girlfriend. A girlfriend changes a man from the shoes he exercises in right up to how he cuts his hair, which Anna did the very next day in front of my barber. Alterations I was due. Fooled by the adrenaline of romance, I ran further than my body could stand. I think we've all been there where we've tried to like impress a partner or whatever. And then we get this like instant messaging conversation. So face of America, when cooks fuck the stew burns. Moonwalker 7, who says that, the village shaman? Face of America, when coaches fuck the team loses, Vince Lombardi. And then there's a long series of questions here which I quite enjoyed. Do you want to have a chat about our relationship, she asked, cleaning up the few outstanding coffee grounds that had fallen into a surgically spotless countertop. Are we an item, I asked. What do you think, she asked back. Do you think of me as your boyfriend? Do you think of me as your girlfriend? Is either one of us going to make a declarative statement? How should I know? I sat down and took a sip of coffee that was too strong. Can I have some milk for this, I asked. Do you think that gunk is good for you? She handed me a small bottle of non-preservative almond milk, the kind that has to be used up in only a few days, the kind that is sold as milk but is actually liquefied nuts. Could you buy real milk so I can have it in my coffee? Why are you so demanding? Is asking for milk a demand? She smiled and took my face in her hands. Do you think you're the man for me? Milk's baby cows, bro. And then we get, uh, before I could muster the vocabulary to actually break up with her, Anna did it for me. You are not the man for me, baby. There was not a smidgen of rancor in her voice, neither judgment nor disappointment. She said it straight out of her face in a way I couldn't. I've known for a while, Anna said, chuckling. I was wearing you down, would have destroyed you over time. When were you gonna let me off your hook, I asked. If you hadn't backed out by Friday morning, we'd have had the talk then. Why Friday morning? Because Friday night I'm going back to Fort Worth. Ricardo was taking me hot air ballooning. A bit of my man pride had me instantly hoping that this Ricardo fellow would not be the man for Anna either. Uh, spoiler alert, he wasn't. So we're moving on here to Christmas Eve 1953. I just thought this was good. This shows you how like one small moment can change a life forever, you know? 
A dance at the Red Cross Centre was so chock a block with soldiers, sailors, and airmen that Virgil needed some air and a few moments away from the crowd. He stepped outside for a smoke and found himself lighting a cigarette for a brown eyed girl named Dolores Gomez. By the end of the next morning, she and Virgil had danced, laughed, had griddle cakes with lots of coffee, and kissed. Two lives change forever. And griddle cakes are just pancakes, except made in a griddle rather than a pan. So this was interesting because there's a reference here to New York not being safe at night, and I can't remember what it was, but I think it was Marathon Man by William Goldman that I read recently, where it was basically talking about the same thing and how it's not a good idea to go to Central Park after dark. Uh, so we have this, but I'm gonna read the paragraph afterwards as well, because it gives you a lot of, um, like, this tells you a lot about this character called Sue, so. As quietly as possible, Sue exited through the front door, making sure the lock clicked behind her. She had once failed to confirm that click and Shelley had angrily lectured her on the dangers of an unlocked apartment door in New York City in 1978. No click was a major no-no. Her roommates had come to view her as an unexercised poltergeist, one that had to be negotiated around. Then again, they were not really her roommates, but her hosts, making Sue feel as welcome as an abdominal parasite. Rebecca had been so friendly the last summer when she was working costumes for the Arizona Civic Light Opera and Sue, a local hire, was playing three featured roles. They were gal powers then. On days when her duties were slack, Rebecca swam in the pool at the Glebe family home and partied with the company on the Glebe patio. She had offered Sue her couch for a while, whenever, if ever, she came to New York City. When Sue showed up with three suitcases, $800 in savings and a dream, Rebecca's actual roommate, Shelley, nodded her assent to the deal with a, yeah, okay. But that was seven weeks ago and Sue was still spending every night on the couch in the small living room. The vibes in the one bedroom apartment just off Upper Broadway had gone from benign acceptance to arctic level iciness. Rebecca wanted Sue out, Shelley wanted her dead. She hoped to purchase extra sofa time and goodwill with contributions of $50 to the rent, as well as providing milk, Tropicana orange juice and, once, a thing called blackout cake that Shelley ate for breakfast. Such gestures were not so much appreciated as expected. Typical New York thing, or at least I assume, I mean I don't, I've never been to New York. That's why Sue Glebe was umbrella-less, navigating eastward on 42nd Street, passing a stone-looking teenager who had pulled his penis out of his pants and was pissing as he stumbled along. Not a single person made note of the site. So moving on to a special weekend, and uh, we have a little kid writing, uh, writing a letter on an IBM typewriter. It's just very cute. Dear Mum, how are you? I am fine. Your friend's sport car is like a race car. I like how loud the motor goes and working the radio. I saw you in the hotel just now and wonder what is my big surprise. I'm going to leave this letter in a place where it will be a surprise for you. After you find it, write me back on this typewriter that is so cool and easy to do. Love, Kenny Stahl. Received, received invoice. I thought this was cool as well, uh, this character. Uh, LA Beast can do this with cards and apples. Good God, Kenny, Bruce said to him. You are growing up as fast as alfalfa. Bruce could do an amazing trick. He could throw a drinking straw into a raw potato and make it stick like an arrow. On the way out through the kitchen, Mum had parked the Fiat in the back. Bruce did the trick for Kenny. Whap! And the straw almost went all the way through the potato. It was amazing. Yeah, Ellie Beast does that with apples and uh, throwing cards. But they have to be like proper professional throwing cards uh, and not just like a regular pack of cards, which is pretty cool. So back on to uh, our town today with Hank Fizzer. So I just thought this was cool. Once home, I set the machine out on the kitchen table and gave it the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog's test. The D key stuck some and the A key had a slight drop in it. The numbers all worked and with some repetitive strikes, the punctuation keys loosened up. I typed, I bought this typewriter today and what do you know, the thing works. When the bell at the end of the line sounded out clear and clean and just like that, I was whooshed into the space-time continuum for a voyage back in time, which lasted either a wink of an eye or for each moment of the last 49 years. So that's the phrase, uh, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. It's quite a well-known one. Uh, and the reason it's significant is, it, is that it uses every letter in the English language. So it's like perfect for testing a typewriter. Then we have the past is important to us. And this is about a guy who can, basically in this society, you can travel back in time, but just for the day is like a tourist thing. So he keeps going back to the World Fair, uh, but he falls in love with a woman in a green dress. But he says here, she was heavier than Cindy than most modern day women, as the 1939 diet was not very calorie conscious and exercise then was the stuff of athletes and laborers. The woman had an actual figure, the curves did her service. I mean, I don't know what planet Tom Hanks is living on, but the American diet has increased calorie wise significantly since the 1930s, which is why obesity is such a huge problem. You'd have the opposite thing, you'd have people in the past would be less likely to be overweight. In fact, Diet is the, the standard American diet, as it's called, is the number one cause of death in America, above smoking. That's how bad Americans' diets are. 
Oh, I just like this as well. Miss Mercury and Stay With Us. And this is written as a screenplay. And she's working as like an executive assistant. She says, one of these days I'm going to quit this job and do something dignified like professional water skiing. So on to uh, go see Costas here. Basically our main character, Asin, is an immigrant and he's sent to Costas, a Greek guy who runs a restaurant in search of a job. Uh, but meanwhile, there's a, a lady called Dorothy who's learning to type by a phonograph. So like a vinyl record basically. And it just tells you what to type and you sit there, listen to it and type along. Which is like just such a, a thing from the past. I think it's really cool. And then, uh, so he goes to see Costas and he says, Go back to Athens, I can do nothing for you. You know where I was when you were jerking off in your shit-filled barn in Bulgaria? I was here. I was in America. And you know what I was doing? Getting my ass kicked for even thinking about this restaurant. But Dimitri said to go see Costas, so I came. He can kiss my ass and you can go piss in a hat. I feed cops here. They'll crack your head open if I ask. Come back again and it's the cops for you. Mm, nice warm welcome. And then finally, Our Town Today with Hank Fizzett again. I just, there's just a line here that I like. Uh, Cup of Joe, pal. Addicted to the stuff. Coffee, that is. I'm a newsman, you see. And the newsroom that doesn't run on coffee puts out a lousy paper, I'll bet. Probably true. So yeah, Tom Hanks and Common Type. I did enjoy it. I gave this a 4 out of 5, actually. As I say, I rounded it up because I think generally a celebrity wouldn't write a book this well. So Hanks clearly spends a lot of time writing and really does love the craft and presumably really loves typewriters. I like the way that the typewriters were used to tie all the different stories together as well. And I also thought it was interesting because because he's not like a classically trained writer, he doesn't necessarily have a beginning, middle and end. A lot of his stories are just middle with no, with no beginning and end. Um, but I actually thought that was really cool. It kind of gave it this effect of snapshots of people's lives as opposed to being like, you know, fully fled short stories, I guess. So uh, yeah, I did enjoy it and I would recommend it if you've been thinking about picking it up. So there we have it, that's what I made of Uncommon Types, some stories by Tom Hanks. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.